So this video is for AQA A-level economics and it's looking at a very specific type of question which can be found on paper one and paper two and that is the nine mark question. Now the nine mark question, so paper one is micro, paper two is macro and it is the exact same technique. So even though this video is going to have more of a focus on macro nine markers it is the exact same technique that can be used on paper one as well. So I'm going to show you a couple of questions and just see if there's anything that you notice in both questions. Hopefully from reading the questions, uh, the first thing that really um, grabs your attention is this with the help of a diagram. Because this is actually the only question on the series of uh, papers for A-level economics which specifically asks you to draw a diagram. Now obviously with 15 and 25 markers there is there is an expectation that you do draw diagrams but this 9 mark question specifically asks you to. It is the instruction of the question. So let's have a look at the uh, the mark scheme in terms of the grid for a 9 marker. And what we can see is it's out of three levels. And I think it's probably just worthwhile um, just having a look at maybe the differences between level three and level two. And there's a few that I've just highlighted. So to begin with, um, level two, it may include a relevant diagram, but level three, it does include a relevant diagram. So in other words, if you, if you don't draw a diagram and you don't follow the instruction of the question, it doesn't really matter how good your explanation is, you are not getting level three. So your diagram has to be drawn to give you any chance of getting level three. Now, what I'd also probably say is um, if you don't draw a diagram, your chain of analysis uh, is probably going to be quite limited. So to be able to get to, for example, level th um, the top end of level two is, is probably going to be quite hard. Um, and, and also it says be accurate and use appropriately. Now, yeah, there's so many mistakes that are made on diagrams, whether it's the labeling, uh, whether it's missing equilibriums. So my advice to you would be is to constantly practice your diagrams test yourself because you've already you should already have in your revision notes all the diagrams that are needed so what you could do is just literally get a white a mini whiteboard or get a piece of paper have a go at a diagram and then just check it afterwards uh, and get your notes out and see if you've drawn it correctly um, but the practice will really it will make perfect and there's so from marking exams there's so many mistakes that are made in diagrams and it's going to cost you in terms of getting to the top end of level three now the rest of level three, um, your answer has to be well organized. So I'll, I'll give you some advice in terms of the structure. Um, it should develop one or more of the key issues. You can get nine marks from just one uh, issue as long as the chain of analysis is, is sound and it's logical. So your knowledge, so it's not just your diagram that has to be accurate. Your knowledge has to be accurate. It needs to be technical. You need to use key terminology. Um, you need to include good application. Now, you have to remember the diagram itself is application. You will get AO2 for your diagram. But the more you apply your diagram to the given situation, the better the application will be. And, and also, just remember that this section of the exam, where the nine marker is, is on the data response. So if you've got a data response section, then you obviously have to respond to the data. If you don't respond to the data, then you're not going to get good application. So you're not going to get into level three. So um, I always say this, it doesn't really matter what the question is. It could be a 25 marker, or a 15 marker, or a nine marker. The biggest mistake you can make on these questions is misinterpreting the question. So my advice would be is to make sure that you break the question down. What's the instruction? Well, you already know it's an explanation, even though the mark scheme does look at chains of analysis. Um, so you do need reasoning. You do need those, those development strands. Uh, with the help of a diagram, so you need to draw a diagram. Uh, what's the context? Well, it is in the section of data responses I've mentioned. So respond to the data, and it usually gives you an idea of what extract you should be looking at. Uh, what is the focus? Now, often there might be one or more, well, what I mean by that, there's sometimes more than one theoretical concept. So make sure that you've um, considered both of them within your answer. Just read the language very carefully because sometimes these nine markers can just be phrased in a, in a slightly different way to what you're used to. And it might mean your diagram is, is different. So it could be to the removal of a tariff while students are potentially used to just drawing a tariff. And you need to look at that language very, very carefully. So um, let's have a look at this one. So uh, with the help of a diagram, explain why a higher rate of economic growth is likely to reduce the budget deficit. So you can already see, obviously, the instructions, the help of a diagram. 
uh, the context is extract E, and the focus, well, there's two. There's budget deficit and there's, a, and there's economic growth, and that economic growth is obviously increasing with regards to the application. So how would you start this answer? I would start it with an introduction. I, mean, I, I wouldn't want that introduction to be too long. I wouldn't want you to spend too much time on it. That introduction just helps you to um, pretty much identify the key concepts. Um, it'll help you to get AO1 marks, hopefully, and it'll just help the answer to flow. So for this one, as I've said, economic growth, budget deficit. Uh, so economic growth is defined as the increase in the real value of goods and services produced uh, as measured by the annual percentage change in real GDP. A budget deficit is government expenditure exceeds, uh, or when, sorry, uh, government expenditure exceeds tax revenue, meaning the government is borrowing. So there you go, you've got your, you've got some AO1 there, you've got knowledge and understanding of the key concepts, and it just starts off your definition, and starts off your answer, sorry. So, now what we need is we need to think about what, what diagram could we use? Some of these nine markers, to be honest, the majority of these nine markers is more than one diagram that you could draw. So for this question itself, I mean, you could, you could have, I'd probably say about three or four different diagrams. But the one thing I would say about the diagrams, you need to make the diagrams clear. I sometimes see um, diagrams which are literally drawn in the corner of the page and they are so small. And I, I honestly think that the smaller the diagram, the more chance of making mistakes uh, because it's not clear to you, never mind the examiner. So I, I would aim for a third of a page. Um, make sure it's labeled accurately. Double check your labels. Market equ uh, equilibriums, are they clearly identified? This is often missed. And there's, with a diagram, you do not want to draw a beautiful diagram. It's, it's completely accurate but then you don't actually apply it to the given situation or you don't embed it within your analysis. So the, the diagram is only as good as in terms of how you apply it to the given situation and how you embed it within your analysis. How does it strengthen your analysis? How does it lend itself to your chains of arguments? So this is one diagram you could have drawn for a higher rate of economic growth. Um, you could have drawn this one. You could have drawn this one. All of these were on the mark scheme. So uh, which one should you go for if you've got three? Um, I've gone for this one, and I'll explain why in a second. Um, but if some, because sometimes the questions are quite open, and because they do give you that choice of diagram, you just have to think to yourself, which diagram do you believe would be the most suitable for the answer that you're given? Some diagrams are not going to be relevant. Some diagrams are not going to be suitable. Some diagrams are going to be completely wrong. And if you misinterpret the question or don't fully break the question down, the chance of picking the wrong diagram obviously increases. So the diagram should be embedded into your analysis. Avoid the floating diagram as a diagram is an instruction and the only question in the economic series which specifically asks for a diagram, it has to be a key focus of your response. You have to make sure that the diagram isn't just a little aspect of your question. It has to be the, the key focus of your question. So, um, as I mentioned previously, uh, it's data response, so let's have a look at ex the extract. Uh, I found this uh, information that I thought might be quite crucial. I also found um, this as well, which I thought could be useful. I'm going to use some of the data just to kind of provide a bit of evidence to my uh, answer. You've already seen my definition and my introduction. So now I'm starting with my actual explanation. So extract E states, if growth slows as the OBR predict, then the budget deficit will increase. So therefore, if economic growth was experienced, uh, then we would expect the budget deficit to fall. So vice versa. So since the Great Recession, recovery of the economy has meant that the deficit has fallen to 2.6% of GDP, when previously it was almost 11%. And this is from the case study. So we can use that data just to start off our reason as to why this might happen. So as we can see in the diagram, as real GDP increases, as does government revenue. And this is the reason why I've used this diagram, because I felt like the AD shift didn't really show this. But this diagram highlights that as we see government revenue going up, we start to see the budget changing in terms of going from budget deficit to a balanced budget to then budget surplus. And we can also see from the axis that we've got obviously government expenditure and revenue, but we've also got real GDP. So as the economy is growing, government revenue is also rising. So the economic activity we see in the diagram along the x-axis will result in derived demand for labour due to increased confidence in consumption and therefore recruitment for workers to produce the output. Consequently, 
Not only will the government experience an increase in the offflow of the claimant count with more people in employment, but those now in work will contribute towards income tax revenue. Furthermore, as consumption increases, not only will this incur VAT, but businesses will experience higher demand, their revenues will increase generating profits, meaning greater corporation tax revenue for the government. Ultimately, this means that the government expenditure and transfers will fall, and tax receipts will then rise, and as the y-axis highlights, the government revenue received will reduce the current account deficit, causing either a balanced or a budget surplus. So the diagram is the key evidence to illustrate why a budget deficit would fall with a rise in actual growth. Another one, so I'll give you another example of a nine marker. Um, so this one based on international trade and protectionism. And again, what's the instruction? Well, explain, help of a diagram, which it always is. What's the context? This one again directs you to extract E. And what's the focus? It's tariffs, but it's also, and this is one that I've seen students neglect, is import volume. So it's not value, it's volume. So that has to be absolutely identified in the diagram. So a tariff, my introduction, is a tax on imports implemented by the government, often for protectionist purposes. So volume of imports for the UK refers to the buying of foreign goods and services in units from UK customers. Now, the reason why I've defined volume of imports is just to kind of make me realise how important volume is for this nine market. If I don't focus on volume, I won't tackle the demands of the examiner. So I've started my reasoning. As Extract D states, China has recently announced new trade tariffs on $60 billion worth of US goods, which include products such as liquefied natural gas. This tax would therefore cause the price of such gas to be more expensive than it previously was when without trade barriers. If we assume world supply to be perfectly elastic due to the sheer amount of competition from the globe, a tariff would shift this world supply from WP1 to WP2 with tariff. So as you can see here, we've got our weld price, we've got our tariff, which is our WP1 and our WP2 with, uh, obviously, with that tariff. Um, what I've done as well, I've actually used the um, the liquefied natural gas as my quantity, so, and that's usually in millions of tons, so I've just put that in there as well. I've also highlighted zero, because I think sometimes highlighting zero just helps in terms of looking at from the point of view of how much of this good has been bought, how much of it is being domestically produced, how much is it with regards to the difference between what it was before the tariff and with the tariff. So, because of the increased price, and assuming unitary price elasticity of demand for domestic customers, because that diagram is showing that, the diagram highlights how consumer surplus falls and the units now being consumed drops from zero to QDF to zero to QDT. So in addition, this has changed the pattern of trade with a lower volume of imports of liquefied natural gas from QSF to QDF and now it is QST to QDT due to more domestic suppliers having the profit incentive to enter the market at a difference of QSF to QST. So again, I've given a reason as to why that's the case. We know that imports are now more expensive. It, it, because the price of the world has risen, it means that domestic suppliers are now more willing to come in because of the profit incentive. And that would be our nine mark for this. We've got an introduction. We've got the initial start of the reason with evidence. We've got the diagram. And then we've got the the use of the diagram to offer that chain of reasoning.